So, um, hi everyone, I'm Naomi. Thanks for, for coming to this um, and thanks for the invitation for the seminar. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, design fiction, which is a method that I use in my research. And I'm specifically going to talk about it in the context of um, AI, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, and why it's a particularly interesting method that people might want to start incorporating into their thinking and their research in this area. Um, so a little bit about myself first. Um, I'm based at Lancaster University in the um, research group which is called Imagination Lancaster. So we are the design department at the university. We're based in the um, Lancaster Institute for Contemporary Arts. And actually, although it is um, design, we do design teaching, we have a lot of um, postgraduate teaching and also undergraduate design courses, it's actually very interdisciplinary. So we have people from, from all over the spectrum, all different types of design and all different other areas working together using design-led research techniques um, to address kind of big, big areas. And I've actually started uh, in imagination in January. I've worked there previously, but I've come back in January as part of a big project called Beyond Imagination. So this is a project funded by Research England to actually boost the capacity of the department. It's actually doubled the staff uh, staffing levels. And what the aim of this project is, is to really expand our research into different areas which, which do have this impact on society and are really kind of critical areas for research. So we've got the, this kind of uh, diagram which shows the kind of structure of how we're looking at our research and it's organized into uh, what we're calling clusters and these clusters um, have kind of different topic areas so you can see it's quite broad ranging we've got you know home and living uh, city and urban community and public sector and the cluster that I'm in is the one called population and policy. So looking at how design can be used to address large scale um, population issues that affect uh, everyone living in, in particular areas, but also how we can use design to um, think about how we develop new policy using design in policy and um, those kind of aspects. So it's a really, it's a really interesting and, and new area. And my particular interest is areas related to policy but also technology. I have a background um, which is quite interesting in myself but I've been doing work on different areas of um, new technology, thinking about things like digital public space, how digital technologies are affecting our communities and societies. So that is kind of my research area. And one of the research methods that I use as I said is design fiction. So I'm going to talk in this in this seminar about um, about these areas. I'm going to say, you know, what is design fiction? Why might we use it? And why is it particularly relevant for doing research on AI? And I'm actually going to talk about these these three bullet points here almost backwards. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about AI and how I understand it and um, how it's actually relevant in this area. So the first question, what do we mean by AI? Well, artificial intelligence, it's intelligence that's artificial, seems fairly straightforward, but actually it's not. And there's a lot of different things which people talk about under the kind of general banner of AI. So we've got the kind of visions of um, intelligences a bit like ours that happen to be artificial. We've got kind of um, super intelligent um, uh, beings who might be in the form of robots or kind of more disparate intelligences that can do all these magical things and uh, you know, act a bit like humans but better than humans thinking, thinking through things that what they call general inter artificial intelligence talking about things like the singularity and all the kind of science fictional aspects but then we've also got the much more mundane everyday uses of AI that actually is all around us now in the modern world and we maybe don't even think about as we go through our, our daily lives we've got them in our smartphones we use them almost constantly especially at the moment we're in we're in this kind of separated um physical space but we're connected through all these these te technological um creations so what we've got in this sense is um what some of my colleagues have called um, definitional dualism we've got the the, the kind of far-reaching almost over-the-top visions of what ai might be on one side and this almost mundane every day on the other and we get a bit confused sometimes 
when we're talking about them about what we're actually meaning in any particular context so we need to actually set out in advance what we're talking about when we talk about ai and I've said about how it's through everything, it's in the mundane. What kind of areas might this include? Well, you know, we have um, the, the kind of the Google search engines, the Amazon recommenders, all these things we use on the internet to, to kind of get us something that's relevant for us, the predictor services, social media. And we have it coming into other sectors as well. So for example, healthcare now is using a lot of AI for prediction, for supporting diagnosis, for doing analysis of scans. We have AI used in, in the legal professions for doing things like um, making recommendations for sentencing, making predictions about how likely someone will be to reoffend. And we have very much talked about at the moment um, face recognition, artificial intelligence being used to really look at big swathes of data, things that, that um, a human wouldn't be able to do and, and make these kind of analyses and identifications. And when we have all these things, we really need to start thinking about how do we make sure that this AI is responsible, that it's actually something which is going to be beneficial and not harmful. And so there's a lot of people doing work in this area, particularly at the moment, um, saying, well, what does it mean to actually use AI in a responsible manner? What, what is a responsible AI system and how do we make sure these are the ones that are being developed? So, for example, we have the, um, the framework developed by um, Floridi and others, which sets out a set of uh, five principles for what a responsible AI system and an ethical AI system should actually look like. And so the first two are that we should have principles of beneficence and non maleficence So it should be something that is benefiting society, that it's generally helpful, and that it doesn't have these kind of negative effects. So really, getting right down to the, to the, 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 the root of it, we don't want any killer robots. We don't want things which are going to harm and kill people. Though interestingly, there are exceptions to that. Uh, it might be that we are, there are some people in some cases developing AI systems for warfare and we have to ask whether that is something that is acceptable in our society if it might for example mean that there is um, less human casualties overall we need to start thinking about bias um, bias is something that's often very inherent in such systems because of the way training data is used i'll talk about that more in a moment and in fact we as humans when we make decisions we're not biased either and in such systems we also might want some bias we want it to be able to actually make decisions which are affected by what it sees otherwise you know what's the point so what it's really about is we want we don't want any unwanted bias that's being biased in ways that are either negative to society or actually even we don't know about and that brings me on to the next one, transparency and explicability. We need to be able to understand and see what these systems are doing, how they're making the decisions, and it needs to be explainable. We need to be able to say, this is how it's actually working. And then we need accountability. We need to be able to say, okay, so this is what it's done. This is who is taking the responsibility, who is accountable for that. This is how we can go back and say, okay, this is, what we can do in the cases where something does actually go wrong and although we have these principles and these principles are being agreed on and discussed a lot um, there's still a bit of a gap between having these kind of ideals and actually making it happen so um, in the last few months algorithm watch has done a big survey and has kind of looked across the, the sector and a lot of these these guidelines that exist for ethical and responsible ai and they've shown that yes there's loads of them they found around 160 different um, different guidelines being developed in all these different sectors but in fact most of them are simply recommendations saying this is what we think should happen there's some which are a voluntary commitment for their members um, but there's only a very few which are a binding agreement which put into place um, regulation to actually say yes this is what has to happen and even though a lot of these are making recommendations or even being binding there's even fewer that actually say this is how we want to make sure that these things happen that give kind of direct instructions of how we get to that place of ethical and responsible ai 
Why is this important? Well, I mentioned we have these issues of bias and really these are having very critical impacts on society. So just to bring up a couple of um, very recent examples. So I mentioned earlier face recognition and how this is becoming used in all sorts of areas. But actually, um, just in the last few weeks, there's actually been a bit of a halt put on developing this technology. So there's a news article here, Amazon banning um, this use for the police. IBM has also said that they're going to take a year to, um, to stop developing this face recognition technology. And one of the key reasons they need to do that is because um, there are issues of bias, specifically um, bias in terms of ethnicity and race. So these systems have been shown to actually have a, a difference in their effectiveness and how they work with regards to people with darker skin. And there are, you know, there are issues on this if they're being used for, for policing, for other discriminatory um, purposes, which are gonna have effects on people from particular um, populations. But then we need to also think more widely, not just about, you know, okay, so this, this system is biased because it's not as, as effective as telling the difference between black people, you know, thinks all black people look the same. Do we want to develop it and make it better for telling the difference between people with dark skin faces if it's then going to be used in a manner which, which we as a society don't agree with, if it's going to be used by, for example, a government for things which perhaps governments shouldn't be doing and, and identifying people in ways which um, count as, as, as surveillance or you know, other, other aspects which are problematic. So we need to think carefully not only about whether the systems are biased but also how they're going to be used. And in a, in a kind of a slightly less um, uh, obvious sense we also have issues in things which much might be kind of much you know generally good intentions but also have these issues. So in medical um, systems for example we might have unwanted bias creeping in just on the basis of the training data set. So if you have for example um, AI being used in um, doing um, analysis and recognition of um, cancer scans, so for example in, in breast cancer, if your training data, if the algorithm was developed based on um, training data from, for example, people in the southwest of the United Kingdom, it might work exceedingly well for people from the southwest, it might work exceedingly well for people in England. If you want to then take that system, take that algorithm and use it, for example, in um, South Asia, suddenly it might be much less effective. You might get um, outcomes which are not the ones you want and it might actually get a different rate of false negatives and false, false positives. So we need to make these systems transparent to actually understand, okay, where did this training data come from? Who made up that data set? Is it gonna be transferable to other contexts? And actually we also need to know why the system is making those judgments. What aspects of that data or these systems is it actually using? So as an example, we might find that a system is very, very good at identifying which cancers are going to have a more serious outcome. But it might be, as is a case that happened, that when we look into what it's doing, we find it's using the borders of the actual images from the scanning machines and it's, it's identifying a particular, a particular type of, of metadata on the image. And when you look back, you say, oh, that metadata says this was from a particular machine at a specific cancer specialist unit and the algorithm is saying oh well we know if it comes from that unit there's going to be more serious outcomes and that's nothing to do with the, the scan and the picture itself but the system is, is making judgments based on extraneous data so we need to understand and say ah actually that's maybe not what we wanted to be doing it's, it's found a loophole so really we need to just understand not only what the system is doing, how it's doing it, but whether it's actually doing what we really want it to be doing or something which looks like it has the same outcome and actually doesn't. So in order to do that, we need to develop these methods for transparency. And one of the things I'm working on at the moment, I've been part of a um, standards development group for um, developing new standards for the IEEE Standards Association. And they have a, a whole raft of standards, new standards being developed at the moment, part of their P7000 series on the use of um, autonomous systems, in, which, which includes AI. And the one that I've been working on specifically is around this question of transparency. So really saying, okay, if we want to have a standard for what does a transparent autonomous system look like, what 
is the what are the criteria that it has to meet to be able to claim to be a transparent system at different levels. And one of the interesting things that that is part of this this standard is that we've said actually you do, you can't just say whether something's transparent or not. There's different levels, but there's also different people who will need different levels of transparency. So the general public, for example, might just need to know, yes, this is an AI system that's being used and they'll be happy with that or that that's enough information. Uh, an expert user, someone who's actually going to be interacting directly with the system, they might need to know how the decisions are being made and whether they can affect that by the ways that they interact with the system. Uh, lawyers or accident investigators might need a lot more information. They might need actual um, access to the data logs and have the whole system be transparent so they can find out where something went wrong in the case of an accident. So there's, there's different amounts of transparency you can have in these systems. So it's all very complex in how we develop and design them. So the question is, how do we start thinking about these things for, for this new technology, very fast moving, that you know, is, is lots of different people working on it, being developed very quickly. We can use design fiction, maybe. So what is design fiction? So design fiction is a, um, a method, is as part of um, design research, and it comes out of other schools of design research of um, critical design and spectrum design. So um, critical design um, developed um, particularly by um, Dan and Rabbi, who, who I have their, their book here, and it's about saying, okay, how can we use design to think critically about the world around us, to develop things which aren't just better things, but maybe are a comment on things being better or worse. And speculative design, uh, speculative design is actually taking that a step further and say, it's not even creating things that are going to be put into manufacture or even at art pieces, but is actually speculating about the future and about the world in different forms than we are now. And design fiction is a particular strand of that, um, coined by Bruce Sterling, who's um, an American science fiction author. And in around 2005, he started talking about this idea of design fiction, using fiction related to almost science fiction to think about design and the way that we create new products, new services, new worlds for us to live in. And this was popularized by um, an interview with, with Julian Bleeker, um, saying that design can be a way of creating material objects that help tell a story. And this idea of storytelling and in fact, almost world building is something that design fiction has taken up. So design fiction, really what it is, it's about saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll create an idea of these, this, this new context, this new world, and we'll create objects which actually allow people to, to see that and interact with, with the world. So these are artifacts almost from a different version of reality, which might be an alternate present, something which hasn't happened but might be happening but isn't real. We might think about things stretching into the future and we create things that actually let you suspend that disbelief, not just by reading a scenario, but actually having a thing you can interact with. So I've just put up a screenshot here of a video. There's the, the YouTube link that, that can be shared. You can watch the whole video. It's about uh, 25 minutes. And this is almost, um, this is a documentary um, about care robots that um, come into your, your home and look after um, elderly family members. And so the documentary isn't saying, what would these be like? It's saying, these are here. We've sold 650,000 of these robots and we're interviewing people who have these in their house. And it's this suspension of disbelief that lets you say, okay, this is a different reality. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pretend it's real and see, see what happens. We also have physical objects. So um, this is a piece that's um, created by, by some colleagues of mine. And they were thinking about ideas of, um, of privacy and of um, the Internet of Things and of objects. Uh, this is a uh, Voigt Kampf machine, which if you've seen Blade Runner, you'll know is named after the device in, in that film in, in the book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is about um, understanding whether somebody is, is, is human or, or a machine. So what this object does, it lets you, uh, it can, you connect it to your, to your phone and it lets you read the emotions of the person that you're talking to. So it's almost an emotion detector to say whether someone you're talking to 
actually is, is feeling positively or negative about you. Now, this is not a device that actually works, but it was uh, created, 3D printed up as an object that you can actually um, use. They created a Kickstarter for the product to kind of show um, how they might actually fund it. So it's almost asking you to, to consider this and consider the issues that might arise if it were real. And the way that this is a useful research tool is it allows you to expand this question of what we might develop and what we might design in the future. So this um, is a diagram which is called a futures cone. So it's um, something which was developed by um, Hancock and Besold. And the idea is that you have the, the point on the, the, the left hand side, which is kind of where we are moving towards the future. And we have different types of futures so that the central blue section is the probable futures. Basically what, what we expect, what we think is going to happen, the kind of if we carry along on the same path we're on now, that's, that's what's going to happen. And then outside that we've got plausible futures. What, what probably might happen? What can we think about as, as options for, for what is kind of likely? The possible futures on the other hand, they're things which might be possible, but it, not necessarily on the current path. We'd have to change something in order to get there. It's outside the plausible, but it's still something we can think about making happen. And then at the very edge, we've got the impossible futures, which is the real kind of fantastical things of actually this, this isn't possible, but it's interesting to, to think about in comparison to the others. And as an extension to this work, um, we have some work from Varas who actually said, OK, so if we've got this cone, we need to think about which bits of it we want to actually aim our development and our design towards. We need to think about the preferable futures, which are a subset of the probable, the plausible and the possible. So what design fiction does is it lets us think about all these different types of futures and say, what is the preferable section? What is the bits we want to go to? And the idea is not to show how things will be necessary. It's not saying this is this, this is definitely um, going to happen. It's not fu futurism, it's not prediction, but it's to open up a discussion and say, okay, what if? Um, we have this other, other section here. So it's, it's almost using props um, in design speculations. Um, so if they facilitate imagining and they help us entertain ideas that, that might not be obvious. So we're thinking through these alternate possibilities and these alternate possibilities might be something wild and imaginary. They might be something quite mundane that actually are the probable futures, how we're going to end up if we change nothing and say, is that really where we want to be or we want to be somewhere different? So I'm just going to just going to use a few examples now of um, how we might do this. And um, these are these are from uh, mainly for my colleagues in imagination and um, just to show that it doesn't necessarily have to be anything um, very kind of object based or, or again fantastical it can be quite mundane so this is a paper called um, Game of Drones which uh, my colleagues um, Joseph Lindley and Paul Colton put out a few years back um, and the, the concept behind this paper was the you know the, the scenario the fiction was about the use of drones in public spaces and they said okay so let's imagine drones are, are coming into very common use and the um, European Parliament puts into place um, a directive which is taken up by the UK government which says that these are the regulations that are in place if drones are to be used. So the paper is actually um, a response to these laws and then looking at um, the kind of the policy making around this and presenting an example of some, some research they're doing about um, gam gamifying these enforcement activities. So they, they give an example of drones being used to um, follow to, to be in public spaces, to look at what people are doing and to actually um, enforce bylaws around dog fouling. So kind of hovering around and, and looking for people who are letting their dogs foul and, and being able to report that back. And they were talking about that, this in terms of the policy and legislation. So the, the paper itself was set out. It didn't start off by saying this is a speculation. It started off by saying these are the laws. This is what's happening. This is our example. And at the very end of the paper, they said, actually, this is not something which is yet happening, but we've been examining it from the point of view of what if. Now, what's interesting, there's two interesting things about this piece of work. 
The first is when they did it, it was actually quite speculative in 2015. Since then, we've actually seen some of these things almost come to pass. So in the recent um, pandemic, we've seen drones actually being used for this kind of enforcement to actually survey areas and see people who are breaking the, the lockdown rule. The other aspect is that almost it was too convincing. So although they did state very clearly in the paper that this was a fiction, this was speculation, they actually had some people uh, when they presented it getting a bit confused and, and, and commenting as if it was real. So they had to say, no, this, this is just a tool for thinking about the future. So you do have to be careful with these fictions to not make them kind of too convincing because we're not trying to deceive people, we're just trying to provoke a, an interesting conversation. So then going on to some stuff that um, I've been doing in my research, um, which is taking that a step further and saying, okay, we can, we can create these things, but how do we then use them with people to, to talk about these issues? So one of the particular areas that, that uh, my research was on was around the Internet of Things. So objects that are um, connected, that have sensors that, that transmit and collect information. And there's a lot of similar questions around these to around AI, particularly how do we make them transparent and trustworthy? And how can we make sure that they're accountable? We understand where the data is going, what's being collected. And particularly this is important when we're thinking about um, the Internet of Things being used in public spaces. Because if you buy, for example, a smart fridge, which is the, the common example, or a smart toaster, and you have it in your house, you're the one that's buying it. You've made that decision to have it in your space. Walking through a city street, on the other hand, you don't necessarily know what's there. You haven't necessarily chosen to have it there or chosen to have your data collected by it. And it's important we, we think about these things um, before we start going ahead with it. A lot of this is being going ahead with in terms of so-called smart cities. A lot of cities are wanting to become smart. So this, um, I've put this slide up here as a as kind of cautionary tale almost of why we need to be careful with these things. So um, a project called the Chicago Ray of Things in um, association with the, the city of Chicago had a project called, called the Array of Things, which they described as being a Fitbit for the city. So we have these, these devices you can see on the left here, um, and these are gonna go on lampposts all around the city to collect all kinds of data about um, air pollution, about traffic levels, about noise levels, of, you know, all, the, all these different things to try and say, how can we improve our city and make it a, a better place to live? Really great ideals, really great project. Uh, everyone was very enthusiastic, the technology was being built, they started to choose with some consultation where these things were going. And then they had some media attention and the newspapers picked up on this and said, well, hang on a minute, you're putting microphones, recorders on all our lampposts. We didn't agree to this, you're, you're spying on us, you're collecting our information. Um, how, how can we have a say in this? You know, is this something we're really comfortable with? And so the project had to be halted where they really thought through, OK, what are our privacy policies? What are we collecting? And, and is this something that people have agreed to? And in fact, not only did they have to change their, their policies and put in a lot more consultation around that, they ended up changing the devices because originally they were going to collect, um, for example, sound data and send this to be processed. They ended up making it so that they processed that data on the devices themselves, so it didn't get sent anywhere, it got deleted and all that got sent was the anonymized data. So that was a way they could deal with some of these, these issues people were concerned about, about privacy. But that was after the project had started, it caused a big delay, they had this big media pushback. And so what we were thinking in our projects was, can we start thinking about these things earlier in the process before we start developing these things and how do we do that? So the project is called Trust Lens. I was working on this when I was at the University of Aberdeen with a team there. And we were working um, in, in Aberdeen um, city area in a particular um, community um, just to the north of the city, just to the north of the university called Tilly Drone. And Tilly Drone is, um, it's an area where there's a lot of, um, there's been in the past a lot of issues with um, social deprivation, a lot of inequality, and it's one of the city's regeneration areas. So there's been quite a lot of attention to try and um, improve the area and work with its community. And the community is actually very active 
um, as a community group to really kind of improve Tilly Drone and, and improve things for its citizens. So we worked very closely in this area and I um, attended a lot of um, community meetings, we did ethnographic work. And one of the things that came up in one of the community meetings was um, a question from them, not, not encouraged by us at all, to say, okay, there's this strange bit of street furniture, this, this bollard you can see on the left. What does it do? It's the only one in the area. It's been installed with this, this new um, bit of road that was, that was redeveloped. Um, it's got an electricity sign on it, so there's clearly electricity going into it. It's something connected to something, but there's no information. No, there's nothing, nobody to contact, nothing saying what it is. Uh, and people were kind of saying, we're not sure about this. And the other thing we were talking about was the smart meters, which are, you know, being national rollout, people saying, oh, do we have to have these? What, it's going to be better for us maybe, but what's that all about? So we started doing a bit of investigation. Um, and the, the questions people wanted to know were things like, who installed this device? Where was it installed? What sensors are in it? What data does it generate? These are all questions which people do ask about the things that are affecting them. So what we really want to understand is what do people want to know about devices in the public areas? And in fact, with the bollard, what we ended up finding out is it was something completely innocuous. It was counting um, pedestrians and cyclists as they go past. It was part of the, the city's transport infrastructure and traditionally that would have been done by someone standing there with a clipboard counting and this was just automating that process but the issue was it wasn't transparent so we wanted to have some design fictions around this question of transparency for devices and what we used as our kind of starting point for that is building a world around issues that people really did care about in Tilly Drone. So one key aspect that people complained about a lot was litter and waste. People really care about the appearance um, and the cleanliness of their local area. So we started this process of world building our design fictions to say, okay, what, what would happen in Tilly Drone if devices were being put in using this technology to help with some of these issues? And we had a, a, a kind of design brainstorm in our group. We talked about all the different sensors that might be used. We talked about the, the problems. We designed solutions that were plausible using kind of real technologies, but not something we as a small research group could actually put in place to test. So we couldn't test it in reality, but what we could do was test it using these design fictions. And so we created three world building scenarios and these design fiction objects for each one. So this was the first one, it was about um, litter bins, which um, were smart bins, and they were installed in Tilly Drone in our scenario. And what they did, they um, had uh, sensors which could tell you how full the bin was, and these could send a signal to the council when it was time for them to be emptied. And they had fire sensors to prevent vandalism if somebody dropped a match in. And they also had a sensor which could detect whether a piece of rubbish was thrown in the bin or in the area around it. And they had other aspects as well, which weren't necessarily so obvious. The objects we created were some newspaper articles. So these were mock-ups of um, two local papers. We have the, um, the Evening Express and the Press and Journal and the uh, two different, slightly different types of newspaper articles. So the Press and Journal um, almost was, was based on a, a, a council press release. It's saying we're bringing these smart bins to Trilly Drone, it's gonna be beneficial, it's gonna help people. The article from the Evening Express from a week later was worrying about spying dustbins and picking up on the fact, well, actually, this bin is being installed next to a playground and what does it what is it actually collecting is it going to be picking up on who's using that playground and in fact the bins do collect your um they, they pick up the phone mac addresses so they can in effect tell who is walking past the bin and so this is the type of thing we developed i'm not going to talk in detail about the others um, but these are the other two one is about um smart bins in um council flats where you had a, an access card so any residents could throw things in the bin to deal with um, fly tipping 
And this other one was almost a, a more of an ecosystem. We had a commercial device um, called Doggo, which you attach to your dog collar and it could um, map your, your uh, journeys with your dog. So when you walk your dog, you can see how, how far you've been, where you're going, and connected that to an open data map of um, council dog waste bins, which again had these fill measurements. So you could not only find your nearest bin, but find one which was, wasn't full. And we used these objects in a public workshop. So this is a participatory aspect. We got people um, from the council, but also residents of Chilidrome, and we got them together and we gave them these devices. And we said, oh, what, or not the devices, the, the, the objects, and said, what do you think of these? You know, what do you, do you think it's a good idea? What do you want to know about it? What can you tell from these objects? And we got people to work through this and had some really good discussions. And a lot of people were very positive, saying, you know, oh, Sounds great, you know, less, less dog fouling. We hate that. But as we kind of poked at these issues, then people started to say, oh, actually, you know, wh who, where's the data going? Who's, who's put this in? Who's, who's in charge of this? And what was really key is we then showed people the fully developed data management. We showed people actually where this information is going, who's in charge. We revealed, for example, that yes, okay, the council is collecting this information from um, from your, your waste bins, but it's not the council. These, these bins have been um, built by a commercial company called Bintech, and the council has access to that data dashboard, but they don't own the data. And this caused people to actually take a step back and go, oh, is that actually, would we be happy with that? Would we want that? Or, or is there more information we'd need before we could sign up on such things? So by using these devices that we had full control over, but we didn't have to actually build and, and make work in their entirety. We could really get into some of these questions. And we found some really interesting things that we wouldn't necessarily maybe have thought about otherwise from what the public really want to know about these things. And people really, really care about the way the information is presented and what they're being told and what they're not. And you know, people were, were potentially, you know, some people said they were happy with it, but said, okay, so if someone's getting financial benefit from this, shouldn't that money be going back into our council? It's coming from, from selling our data. That's all right, as long as we get some benefit from it. So these were really interesting um, qualitative research outcomes that were much deeper than you'd get by just giving someone a scenario because they could really, with these objects, put themselves in the world of this process. So I've talked a lot about design fiction in, in a more general context. I'm now going to give a few examples um, early examples of how we might think about this in the context of AI. Um, so this is a, um, an image from a paper, it's actually being presented in a couple of weeks time at the um, design, at the DRS conference. Um, and this is um, an example of some design fiction work, putting up um, signposts. This is actually in our, um, in our building in, in Leica, in Lancaster. And they put up signs talking about the the use of AI in the building. So this one here is um, an indemnity notice that's saying, you know, if you're coming into this space, AI will be used to analyze you and you're, you're, you're giving your consent by coming into this space. So there's, there's no way to opt out, though it does talk about using a doctor's note. Um, it talks about how it's using um, AI to analyze the footfall in space and processing um, of, of using camera processing to look at um, attendance and also well-being. So there's some, some interesting things about that. And the, they had these signs in other places as well. So there was one on the, on the toilets saying, yes, we are collecting your, your DNA data if you use these toilets. So this is not things that were actually happening, but these fictions start to question some of the aspects of how AI might plausibly be used to really get you to think about, would you be comfortable with that? well, wait a minute, there is no way to opt out if AI is being used for an analysis in a public space. And the work that I'm doing um, with this network at the moment, um, so this is how kind of my route into this, is also in association with um, another network plus the um, Internet of Food Things. Thinking about AI, in the context of um, the food sector and specifically in use of data trusts. So um, in the food sector in the, with supply chains, we have huge amounts of data available 
um, being created by different organizations, different companies who may not be comfortable sharing it because a lot of this is um, protected, very valuable data. But if we could put it together, then we can completely transform the food supply sector, the system, um, in ways which are particularly critical at the moment, you know, in the context of, for example, being in a, in a pandemic. So if we can create a data trust where this data can be um, shared in a trustworthy manner that there is controlled centrally and can put benefit back out to the members, that's something that's being developed that, that could be really critical. But if we're going to do that, particularly if we're going to be using AI to do analysis on this data, we need to really think about the ethical questions that surround that, that usage. And so what we're proposing in, in this pilot project we're working on is to develop a speculative design piece, a, a design fiction around a data trust that uses AI and say, OK, we've created this without having to worry about the technology and actually making it work now we can start to interrogate it for ethics without actually having got to the point where oh it's built it's too late we can't change it now so really that is an example of how we might use design fiction to really improve the ai systems and also the policy making around it to say how do we get to a point that's a better one without having to completely break down things we're already in process and being used um, and really, that's that's what I wanted to tell you about. So um, thanks very much. Uh, I think we'll have some time for questions now.